I'm Joe Devine and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. This is just a uh, brief introduction to let you know that I am currently on holiday for a couple of weeks. So Josh from our other podcast, This Football Life, has kindly agreed to cover my absence uh, for a couple of episodes. And he's got uh, two brilliant guests lined up. Uh, The episodes sound really exciting. So without further ado, I will leave him to introduce uh, what's happening today and also what's happening next week. But I hope you all have a lovely time and I will be back in a couple of weeks. So speak to you then. As Joe said, I'm Josh Schneiderweiler from TIFO's This Football Life podcast, and I'm happy to be hosting these two weeks while Joe is away on a holiday. And like you guys, I'm going to miss his smooth, melodic voice too. But the show must go on, and for this week's episode, I chat with David Bolkover, author of The Greatest Comeback, which chronicles one of football's first coaching pioneers, Bella Gutman. A brief background on Bella. He played in Austria, Hungary, and in the United States in the 1920s, and then coached in Austria and Hungary in the 1930s. He then survived the Holocaust in truly remarkable fashion before coaching in numerous countries, including Italy, Brazil, and Portugal. He's most famous for being Benfica's manager when they won back-to-back European Cups in 1961 and 1962. We discuss all of this and more on this week's episode of the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm here with David Bolkover, uh, author of The Greatest Comeback. David, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Uh, in your book, uh, you repeatedly compare Bella uh, Gutman uh, to Jose Mourinho many, many times. And I'm, I'm curious, how are, they, how are the two similar? Well, I think in the, in the, the main reason is that Gutman was such a short-term manager, and that, that's what Mourinho is known for. So in, in, in a crude sense, I think we can divide football managers into two. Uh, we can, uh, the first category is the, the short-term manager, who comes in often uh, you know, as a change agent when things aren't going well uh, in a football club. And, and by the sheer force of their uh, personality and by making astute short-term signings, they turn things around. And uh, Goodman was very much the archetype of that short-term manager. And I think Mourinho falls into that category as well. Obviously, we have the, 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 there's the long-term manager as well. You know, Alex Ferguson, Matt Busby, the, these managers are, are more... Uh, uh, prevalent, have been more prevalent in, in, in British football history than on the continent. Uh, but Goodman certainly uh, is, was never a long-term manager. He only managed the third season actually once, and that was at Benfica when he actually won the European Cup in his third season. So that, that, is, that is the main similarity with Mourinho, but there are a lot of differences as well. Yeah, I mean, he's famous for having the quote, uh, the third season is fatal. Um, but there, were, there was something else that really stood out to me, uh, which uh, I just kind of gravitated towards more, which was he seemed to always be an outsider. Uh, I mean, he has a quote, or there's a quote in the book that he said, uh, which was, I always had two burdens to carry. One is due to the fact that I am everywhere a foreigner and the other is because I am a Jew. And I've always felt that Mourinho was always felt like, you know, he had a him against the world mentality because he always felt like he was an outsider. Uh, Would you agree? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, football managers, I think, I think, I think a lot of the football, great football managers do tend to be, uh, outsiders and they they sort of convey this spirit to their team and that creates some sort of bunker mentality motivation uh, it, it's it's us against the world uh, Gutman was the archetypal uh, outsider uh, he suffered from a lot of racism anti-semitism throughout his career he was a holocaust survivor he didn't trust he he didn't trust anybody and I think it was th- this feeling of outsiderness uh, which enables him and other outsiders to be innovative. If you're part of a club, uh, if you're an insider, you might get a comfortable career working inside a large uh, corporation, just agreeing with what everyone else says. But if you're an entrepreneur, and Gutman and Mourinho are footballing entrepreneurs, if you like, innovators, uh, then it helps if you're an outsider because you reject the common wisdom 
and you, you you follow your own path and you set a new agenda. So how how was he an innovator? How was he progressive? I I, th- I think the main reason uh, he was a, he, he did come up with some tactical uh, innovations, but I think the main innovation was really establishing the cult of the coach he was absolutely um uh insistent that he as the coach has complete control over the team now you know uh, ferguson alex ferguson often said the coach needs total control to 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 be able to operate effectively it was gutman i think who first articulated this point so clearly that the coach is vital to team success and the coach must have complete control, not the board of directors. And uh, it seems difficult to believe now, because now we're very much uh, living in the era of the cult of the coach. But before Goodman, that cult, the the importance of the coach had not yet been fully established. Uh, It was the players who were deemed really to achieve the success. The coach was relatively unimportant. And of, of course, Goodman throughout his career was pushing for more money. And despite his success, often he'd be turned down. That would be unheard of now. So he was a pioneer in pushing this idea of the importance of the coach. Uh, but, but how did he kind of uh, push it um, and, and make it so uh, accepted or you know, make this cult of the coach? How did he do it? He, he, he was a great... Uh, uh, self advertiser uh, a bit like Mourinho uh, you know talking about his successes making sure that everyone understood what he was doing how he had changed things how he had achieved success and uh, there are so many quotes that I think dotted throughout my book uh, about uh, about with Goodman saying what he'd achieved and angry that others had not recognized what he had done saying, look at Benfica, what have they done since I, I've left, etc. Uh, and really promoting this idea in the public sphere that the coach is all important. Yeah, and I mean, he was also, you know, kind of early in the game, used the media to, you know, manipulate his players and play the, you know, the game that now Jose Mourinho is so famous for. Uh, with using the media as a psychological tool. I mean, I know he did it with refs as well, and uh, that was it was he was kind of you know one of the first to do that as well. Yeah, well, you know, you know, Mourinho says things like, um, uh, you know, the the, the 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 football match does not start when the referee blows his whistle. The football match starts when I have my press conference the day before the game, because that effectively is when he can motivate his own players and he can intimidate the opposition and the media often refer to Mourinho and Ferguson uh, using the press conference as, as great psychology as if uh, as if it's a, a, an innovation but Gutman was doing all this 60 years ago before the European Cup semi-final in uh, 1962 Benfica were playing at Tottenham Hotspur it was the second leg at White Hart Lane, and Benfica had won the first leg 3-1. And the second leg was about to take place at White Hart Lane. This is, by the way, the biggest match ever in the history of Tottenham Hotspur. And they suppose were a great side, and um, many people were tipping them for victory. They'd won the double uh, the year before. And uh, Goodman got the press together the day before the game, and the first thing he said was, I'm worried about this referee, this Danish referee. He's weak. Uh, my players are small, skillful Portuguese players. Uh, we're facing the, the, the likes of Dave, Dave Mackay, Bobby Smith, these tough, physical, typical British players. I don't think the referee will be up to it. And by the way, I'm leaving at the end of the season because Benfica won't pay me any more money effectively. So by doing those two things, he put pressure on the referee and he took pressure off his players by distracting the media away from his players and on to him and afterwards he said he was very pleased with the referee's performance that he gave so many free kicks to Benfica. Yeah, so so a little reverse psychology you know 60 years in advance. <laughs> Absolutely. Mean. 
Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, he's had a profound effect on coaches now, uh, you know, Mourinho and uh, many others, but, or Sir, Sir Alex Ferguson, uh, but what coaches rubbed off on him, you know, before he was a manager? I mean, I think he started in the late 30s, uh, if my memory from the book serves me correctly. So, you know, who kind of preceded him? The, the biggest influence on Gutman's career by his own uh, admission and a, a huge influence on other great Hungarian coaches and, in fact, on the uh, great Hungarian team teams uh, of the post-war era was a, was a British guy, a, a Lancastrian by the name of uh, Jimmy Hogan. And he, Jimmy Hogan, ended up at MTK Budapest. He actually uh, resigned uh, shortly or, or left shortly before Gutman started playing for MTK, but his influence on MTK and on Hungarian football uh, was huge. In fact, Gustav Sebes, who was the coach of the great Hungarian golden team of the 1950s, said that everything that uh, the way Hungarians played owed everything to uh, Jimmy Jimmy Hogan, and Hogan had a great accent. On, on on fitness, he, he he believed in very rigorous uh, training schedules. He believed in clean living, uh, non drinking. Uh, this is 60, 70 years ahead of its time when it, when, when we look at UK British football, for example, where players were still getting bladdered the night before the match, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so he he was a, he very, Jimmy Hogan was very much uh, an outsider. He was always looking for that little one percent of an advantage for his team. He was he he brought in uh, young players. He located he identified young players of great potential, and then he inculcated them with his own preferred uh, style of play. The accent that style of play was very much a passing game, uh, which was innovative in Europe at the time. And Gutman uh, took on a lot of Hogan's characteristics, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that way of really giving uh, youth, power, uh, youth power and uh, ability. I mean, there's a great quote that uh, I wrote down uh, from, from your book that Jimmy Hogan said, which was, the basis of modern football in this age must be built around the holy trinity of handling the ball, fitness, and constructive tactics. I mean, if that was said in the 90s or the 2000s, you know, that would have still be seen been seen as a quite, uh, you know, revolution, well, not revolutionary, but like, you know, progressive forward thinking idea. I mean, that's right. Uh, yeah, he, he, he really was. Uh, he really was ahead of his time. Uh, Jimmy Hogan, he, ne he never really made it in English football. Uh, they were suspicious of a of a guy that had, had gone abroad. These, these were they, these were very uh, British football only became open really to foreign influence in the last 20 30 years and it was an extremely parochial then so this whole idea of an english football manager going abroad he, he wasn't really respected uh for that you mentioned young coaches young young players and of course this is this is a major uh, difference between uh, gutman and uh Mourinho. i talked about the similarities but there were differences as well and one of those differences was uh the fact that gutman trusted young players he famously brought in Antonio Samoas at the age of 17 to make his debut in the World Championship final for Benfica against Penarol in 1961. This is something that Mourinho would never do. He would never bring in a player for the debut at age 17 for such a big, for such a big match. Yeah, and, and Eusebio, and uh, you give countless examples in the book of, of, of players he gave an opportunity uh, very early on when, it, when they didn't really have the, the uh, experience and pedigree. Uh, and, you know, you, you mentioned how the British were, you know, wary of uh, uh, outside influence. Although, like, you know, I, I was speaking with Ron Atkinson a couple months ago, and he actually mentioned Jimmy Hogan and uh, how it even influenced him uh, because he was uh, talking about uh, how uh, Hogan came with the, he was watching the Hanved team and, uh you know, in the early 50s. So, I mean, it, it did reach a couple people. I know that. <laughs> yeah, he's six. He managed uh, Padova, Triestina, then he got his big break at AC Milan, and then he, he, he managed Vicenza. Now, in all four of those instances, he started off 
uh, with incredibly uh, uh, successful results. Uh, and uh, and it looked like, for example, at AC Milan in the 1954-5 uh, season that he was about to win the league uh, because they'd started off so well. Uh, but then they, t- uh, they then they faded. And I think the reason was that he trained the players too hard. He believed very much in fitness, but there was a, there was a recurring pattern here that they. Um, the 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 player the, the the teams faded away in the second half of the season. So it was obvious that the players were getting physically uh, exhausted. So he amended his strategy and he he, he relaxed his training schedule. And also uh, one of his innovations was rotation. Uh, and again, rotation is often uh, thought of, considered to be a relatively modern concept that uh, football managers realise that players get too tired. Uh, that they can't play 60, 70 games a season, uh, and the, the, uh, the players, uh, the manager needs to rotate the squad. Well, Mourinho, uh, sorry, Goodman was doing that in the early 1960s with his Benfica players. Uh, there was one uh, instance where they had two legs of the European Cup semi-final within six or seven days of each other, and there was a league, ga- league game, which is quite important, sandwiched in between, and Goodman actually rested eight of his players. So he uh, he obviously came to the conclusion that he needed to go easy on the players a little bit. Yeah, and, and so this whole transformation, he's really, this is when he started learning uh, his trade because obviously he got uh, his, his trade uh, kind of curtailed a bit because of the Holocaust and his development stunted a bit. So he was still kind of undergoing that, that learning and it really kind of all came into fruition in Brazil. Uh, can you speak just a little bit about the influ- how Brazil influenced him and then also his uh, big impact on Brazilian football? Well, I think uh, Sao Paulo, he had an inc- incredibly successful spell in world football between 1957 uh, and 1962. He was already in his late 50s by the time that period started. You've got to understand that his career was... Uh, delayed so, uh, somewhat by the fact that he spent six years in the, in what should have been the peak of his career uh, trying to escape from the Nazis. So Brazil really put him on the, on the right path. He went to manage Sao Paulo in uh, 1957 and he won uh, the Brazilian league there. Uh, and I think uh, what this enabled him to do uh, was to marry the great technique of the uh, Brazilian players with the more pragmatic uh, European uh, style. And I think this is why uh, he was so successful there. He's often been credited with bringing the 4 2 4 formation uh, from Europe to Brazil. The 4 2 4 formation was then used by Brazil uh, in 1958 when they won the World Cup. Uh, Jonathan Wilson, in in his book, uh, The History of Football Tactics, uh, called the Inverting, Inverting the Pyramid, he, um, he says this isn't actually true. And the, the 4-2-4 formation had actually been uh, already introduced into Brazilian football. But what Gutman did, it, did bring in was this directness. And he was very keen to tell his Brazilian players, who were intoxicated often by... Uh, very ostentatious uh, displays of skill uh, that they these were all very well but if they didn't result in a goal there was not no there was no really point and, uh, and, and he, he encouraged his Brazilian players to be more direct to shoot to cross uh, at, 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 at a more at more opportunity when they had that opportunity to do so and not to uh, and, and not to get too distracted uh, by just trying to impress the crowd with ball juggling, for example. Yeah, I mean, uh, it really comes through in the book. Just when you're in the box, shoot it. Shoot it again, shoot it some more. Like, it, it was driven really home to his his players. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so then how did... So what did he take from Brazil? I mean, and also just for the for the listeners, you know, at the time he went to Sao Paulo, they were not a powerhouse club. They were not... The, the Sao Paulo that we know now, uh, just just for the listeners uh, to know that. But how did uh, Brazilian 
football impact him as he moved to to Benfica? I I think I think I think the main the main the main thing really was it gave him momentum in his career, uh, and it was a major trophy, uh, and it alerted the Portuguese speaking world to good because obviously the, the Brazil and Portugal have very close links. The fact that he achieved so much in Brazil really got him the job at FC Porto in 1958. Uh, and he went from strength to strength there as well. And then on, on, then on to Benfica after that. Yeah, and he won the title at, at Porto uh, as well, which they hadn't done in, in, a, in a long time uh, as well. And then he, he made the, the, mo- the m- much hated uh, move to their rivals, uh, ben- Benfica. Um, can you kind of describe uh, just one, uh, that transition, but from Porto to Benfica and also at the time, what, what he was walking into at uh, Benfica? Uh, you know, Portugal uh, are the European champions now, and we have a tendency to think of Portugal as a major uh, footballing nation. But in the 1950s, in the late 1950s, uh, they weren't. I don't think they'd even qualified for a World Cup then. Uh, the uh, Portuguese teams hadn't got past the first round of the European Cup since its inception in 1955. Uh, Benfica themselves hadn't won the league uh, for two years. And he went from Porto, who were their hated rivals, and he went, having won the league with Porto, in 1959, he immediately left uh, because Benfica offered him more money uh, and uh, and set about resting uh, the league back. He he oh, he was a hated figure in Porto for obvious reasons for the next few years. Uh, but what I say in my book is that you know maybe some uh, people would be intimidated by making that move and having to have a police guard uh, every time he went uh, back to Porto with his Benfica team. But after what he had experienced as a Jew playing for Jewish teams uh, in Austria uh, and in Hungary, uh, this would have been all water off a duck's back and would have been completely tame by comparison. Yeah. And and so he wins back to back cups. And and then he and then after that, he leaves, uh, which I, I think is very telling of of him as a as a coach and as a person, because, I mean, he left because of money uh they as you mentioned uh at that time they didn't really respect coaches as much and he left because of the money and i thought that was really illustrative of his, of his career and kind of ties into his uh jewish identity i mean this was something that happened numerous times in his career as you mentioned from porto as well uh, so can you just kind of uh elaborate on that a little bit yeah he, he goodman didn't really have any loyalty to any any club he didn't have any loyalty uh, towards any country. And given his experiences in his life, where not only did he survive the Holocaust, but he also uh, fled from anti-Semitism uh, uh, else, uh, other times, for example, in, in Hungary in the early 1920s. Uh, this, isn't really, uh, this is really not surprising. He uh, realized that the world uh, was not going to do him any favors. Uh, that the world showed him no loyalty and therefore he was going to get the maximum he could from from every club, uh, from every club he could uh, and make the most of his ability to manage football teams. Uh, it was as simple as that. Yeah, and he wasn't he re- wasn't really financially well off. And, and you get into the book uh, in a lot more detail and I, and I won't now because we don't have all day to talk about it. But, you know, he wasn't extremely well off because he lost all of his money in the, the Great Depression. Um, you know, in, in the early 30s. Uh, so he, he was, you know, kind of back to square one um, for a lot of his career. But uh, the, it's interesting because he's almost most well known for his curse, the curse of that he, uh, you know, legendarily or mythically put on Benfica. Uh, and it's something that isn't really verified. I mean, even you and your book kind of talk about how it, it it was kind of just a myth that he put this curse on Benfica that they wouldn't win for you know a hundred years, and uh, they've lost eight European finals since. So can you uh, <laughs> kind of talk about the origin of this curse? Yeah, uh, well, the first time it's really mentioned 
actually it was not <laughs> people think that this people have been talking about the curse since Gutman left in 1962 when he allegedly uh, said to the Benfica board when they didn't give him more money having won the European Cup for the second year in succession he allegedly said to them uh, you Benfica will not win another European trophy for 100 years and they've been in eight finals since then they've, they've lost every single one uh, people think uh, that we've been talking about the curse since 1962 but actually the first time it really appears uh, in the Portuguese press is in the late 1980s when Benfica 1988 I think it was when Benfica lost on penalties in the European Cup final to uh, PSV Eindhoven no th there isn't documentary uh, documented evidence of any curse by uh, Bella Gutman what I would say is that he was exceptionally angry with Benfica for the way he thought he was treated, uh, for the fact that it, they didn't give him the money he wanted, for the fact that they then paid other coaches who were n nowhere near as successful as him, subsequent coaches, more money than he was paid. He was absolutely livid about it. So if he, um, he probably did curse Benfica in some way, uh, but not necessarily in, in the words that have been attributed to him. Uh, did you find in your uh, research that like fans in Benfica still believe in this curse? Oh yeah, they're, 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 they are obs they're obsessed by it. It's all it's all over the internet the whole time, and uh, you know any time Benfica get near to a European final, uh, the, you know the chat among in in, in the Benfica, um, uh, you know in social media uh, starts accelerating. Yeah, they're obsessed by it. And there's one famous story, of course, when uh, Eusebio, who um, Gutman actually discovered in Mozambique in, in 1960, and uh, before the European Cup final in 1990, uh, Gutman had died in 1981, and Eusebio had retired by that point, but Benfica were due to take on AC Milan in uh, Vienna. And Gutman is buried in Vienna, and Eusebio allegedly went to the grave of uh, Gutman in the Jewish cemetery in Vienna, and he is said to have knelt before the grave and asked Gutman to to lift the curse, uh, but obviously Gutman refused, and Milan won one nil. Since you brought it up, uh, he's he's buried in a Jewish cemetery, and something that you you uh, go into depth in the book is the love of his wife, who is a Christian, and yeah. she's and he's buried in an orthodox uh, Jewish cemetery, and she obviously cannot be buried there uh, next to him. Uh, so it, clearly his Jewish uh, identity, uh, there was, you know, he had a real identity with it uh, to be buried away from his wife. And so I was hoping you could just kind of go into how strong the I, his Jewish identity was and his connection and how it uh, intermixed with his coaching and his playing career, for that matter, as well. Well, his, his playing career was almost exclusively spent playing for Jewish teams. Uh, it's quite, it was quite possible. It seems difficult to believe now. Uh, but it was quite possible before the Holocaust for a top player to play almost his entire career for only Jewish teams. He started off at MTK uh, Budapest, which was a, a club founded uh, by Jewish business people and supported by mostly Jews. Even now, uh, their sparse crowds are populated mostly by uh, Hungarian Jews. He then went to Hakoach Vienna, a very different type of Jewish club. Uh, they were uh, the Jewish Jewish nationalism was uh, very much to the forefront. Uh, it was a Zionist uh, football team. That was the ethos of the club. They wore the blue and white of the Jewish national movement. They wore a large Star of David on their shirts. Uh, they used to sing uh, the Hatikva, the song of the Jewish national movement, now the Israeli national anthem, uh, before before the game. And remarkably, this team, in the midst of appalling hatred and racism, won the Austrian league, which is a very high quality league, uh, in 1925. The government then went, went off to the United States Again, he played for uh, Jewish teams, Hakoach uh, New York, Hakoach All-Stars. These were teams based on the ethos of Hakoach uh, Vienna. So, uh, yeah, he, along with many uh, Jewish players, uh, played for Jewish teams. 
he had a very strong uh, Jewish social network. And you can see throughout his career, his coaching career, that other Jews helped him uh, to to find new jobs. In terms of his Jewish identity, uh, this is very extremely complex. Uh, and Gutman played down his Jewishness after the war, as did many uh, of the remnants, the few remnants of European Jews after the Holocaust, uh, for obvious reasons. They 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 feared anti-Semitism, uh, ha- having gone through what they did, and they just wanted to get on with their own their own lives. Uh, he had another. The, the only time actually when he mentioned uh, overtly being Jewish was after it was in 1964. In 1964, he actually published an autobiography. Uh, it published in German. Uh, and despite the fact he played for all these Jewish teams, despite the fact that he was a survivor of the Holocaust, despite his own upbringing, he doesn't mention the word Jew in the entire book of 80,000 words. So this is this is this is demonstration of how much he was trying to hide his Jewish identity. But in that very same year, he got a job as the coach of the Austrian national team. And he lost his temper effectively after a few months. He said he just couldn't stand the constant anti-Semitism from the players, the media uh, and the footballing establishment. And that was the only time really on record where he talked about the anti-Semitism he had to face throughout his career. Yeah, I mean, it 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 really blew my mind when I saw I read that that he had, didn't mention the word Jew once in his entire autobiography. I mean, it, it I I was kind of dumbfounded when I read that. Um, it was it was quite remarkable. Uh, is it is there any favorite Bella story that you have um, that you think might you know summarize or characterize his career uh, or uh, his you know Jewish identity or um, any some part of the hardships that he went through? Well, there, 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 are, there, are, there are so many, really. I mean, really, the, 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 the story which really hits home um, is the story which he recounts himself of his time in, in a slave labor camp uh, in the surrounds of Budapest in 1944, uh, when he describes the sadism of the Hungarian guards, the humiliation uh, that he had to uh, that he had to uh, endure, uh, and uh, the fact that you just trying to imagine this 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 guy who wasn't a young guy then he was 45, and this would have finished off uh, many people, and his father, who was 78, was murdered at Auschwitz. His sister was murdered. His nephew, his sister-in-law, his brother-in-law, his whole community really uh, was wiped off the face of the earth. And so many of us would crumble in, in that situation. And people ask me whether I like Gutman. There's a lot not to like about Bella Gutman. He's, he's a very complex character. But my admiration for him is huge. Uh, the fact that he managed to put all this behind him, uh, this terrible humiliation and personal grief and trauma and just 16 years later lift the greatest most prestigious sporting tournament in the very continent that had wanted him dead so recently uh is for me such an incredibly powerful story it it really is and uh the book you know i'm not just saying this because uh, i'm trying to you know suck up to you i i i I love the book and uh, that transformation was incredible I have to. I have to know. Is there anything that didn't make it in the book that uh, you would have liked to include? I there's a couple of things. Um, Goodman lost his job in 1939. He just won, as you said, the Hungarian League and also the Mitropa Cup, which was the primary um, cross-border football competition at, the, at that time, the precursor to the European Cup. And he lost his job in 1939. He got an informal job as a scout behind the scenes. Uh, Jews weren't allowed to have uh, very overt roles like coach of a top football team, but he, uh, the Jewish chairman at Oipesh, the club, gave him uh, a part-time role as a scout, uh, scouting uh, you know, opposition for Oipesh in advance of games. 
Uh, but there, there is a gap uh, that we can't fill. And that, I think, is from about 1939 and 1942, when he, I think, was offered this, uh, this part-time role. And I, I s- strongly suspect that those three years were an awful period for Bella Gutman. There weren't jobs for Jews. Jews were effectively banned from many occupations. Most uh, and uh, companies had a limit on the amount of Jews they could employ. So many Jews were forced into unemployment. I, I think Gutman himself probably suffered from terrible poverty uh, during those three years. I would love to be able to find out more uh, about what happened those missing uh, three years. There's one incident that I did try to um, uh, dig further on. Um, I mentioned the parochialism of English football. And it seems amazing now to think that this great, uh, this great coach who achieved so much uh, and won the European Cup uh, was never uh, offered a job in England. And he made overtures uh, to English teams after he won the European Cup uh, for the second time in 1962. Bear in mind, he had lived in the United States for six years in the 20s and 30s, so he must have spoken English well. And he made overtures. He, he had an article in the Evening Standard uh, on the day of the Tottenham Hotspur semi-final. And he was interviewed and he said, listen, I, I really want to manage in England. It's the, it, it, you know, the, 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 the English founded the, the game of football. I'd love to manage there. And there was only one team that approached him. And that team was Port Vale, who had just finished 12th in the English third division. And I've actually written to Port Vale to try and find out if they know anything anything more about uh, that approach uh, but I, ha- I haven't managed to find anything out from them uh, I would love to, I would love to know more about that and w- what actually happened uh, uh, what actually happened in that approach is it, it one of the more r- uh, remarkable stories in the in, in the Gutman biography yeah quite quite fascinating and if if anyone in Port Vale right now is reading this uh, and, and you know anything uh, <laughs> shoot us an email um, you know, um, but what a what a fascinating career. I, we we could go on and on. Uh, I mean, because the the story is incredible, and we haven't even touched on uh, his incredible playing career. And uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the holo, uh, you know Holocaust years, which you go into great depth um, in the book about, or not it, your investigation into those years and um, that those preceding years. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, for chatting and telling us about uh, Bella Gut- uh, Gutman. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure too.